Martin's going to share his thoughts about realistic um, palliative care for uh, an aging population. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I'm, as I said, Martin Wilson. I'm a consultant. I work up in Ragmore Hospital up in Highland. I'm a really good speaker to have before lunch because I speak really, really quickly. Um, <laughs> And also, I'm really skinny, so I need to eat about every hour or so, or I get really hungry. So I'll probably get hungry before, before you do, okay? And I can hear rumbles as well. So, Realistic Palliative Care in Aging Population was the title I was given. Um, if I did longer, I'd have probably called it the long walk home, okay? So I work in Highlands, so it's my excuse to put a lovely Highland road there. So to help us, we're gonna meet uh, Beyonce's granny, the old boy from Up, Abba, the Spice Girls, and we're going to have a wee bit of an argument over spilt milk, OK? So if you're at all bored, OK, what you need to do is try and think ahead of time what Beyonce song, what ABBA song, and what um, Spice Girls song uh, I'm going to use to demonstrate my points here, OK? Uh, confidence and confidentiality, OK? None of the case examples I use here are real life stories, OK? But they're all true, OK? <laughs> whether, whether I go down well or not, doesn't matter as much as what I'm saying is true and reflects the sort of things I'm hearing from my patients and seeing in the, seeing in the public. First, the bits I want you to take you away. So, multimorbid and frail adults, right? Age isn't helpful, okay, I'll talk about that in a wee second, but the idea of multimorbidity and frailty is very helpful indeed. For patients that are in that group, there's often a long phase where people could die. It t their death and the end of the things tends to be very dependent on intercurrent and unpredictable events and it can feel like an awfully long time to be dying or palliative for. Okay, so anyone that's had family members going through this will have, have a good awareness of this. So, and anyway, most valuable assets in palliative care, you've given me a stage, I'll say what I like, okay? <laughs> is uh, <laughs> is uh, number one, unpaid carers, otherwise known as family, but not always. Neighbors, friends do an awful lot of work as well. They are by far the most valuable asset. Paid carers are our second most valuable asset. Nursing home beds are the third, okay? There is a number four, but you're gonna to have to wait until the end of the presentation for that, okay? All right, so pretty much nobody in the room, unless you're actually a carer of yourself, is on that list. How do we look, how do we look in advance? Key priorities, public and clinician education is the main thing we need to do, okay? The public will eventually decide what the health service looks like. It's publicly funded, it's a big political issue. It's owned by the public, it's nationally, it's nationally funded. So public, hence politicians and clinicians, all need to understand what death and dying actually looks like. And these are the points that I made before. Dying can take longer and is a lot less tidy than people presume, you all know that. Secondly, you are very likely to need hands-on personal care before you die. Help with washing, help with dressing, help with getting to the toilet and back, help getting cleaned up before you die. Almost nobody thinks about that until it happens, and then it's everything, okay? At a point when you have no political power to actually help that happening. Because the time when you do have political power, like everybody in the room just now, because we're all quite fit and well, we're still interested in expensive interventions. Expensive interventions sell themselves, okay? The push is needed on the things that support basic care, I think, okay? Expensive interventions like hospices, okay? So you could all go away from now and go, I know what I'll do. I'm going to shut the hospice and reinvest the money elsewhere, okay? You could do that. The following day, a charity would be set up to rebuild that hospice, involving none of you, okay? So you would have to do, you know, <laughs> you, you would have to do that. It sells itself. People are just sold on it. It's going to happen. You need to spend all your effort pushing the things that folk don't think about that are valuable. A different spin on demographics. Age is not the main problem. It's not even in the top three, okay? What's the ABBA song? Money, money, money. Okay, <laughs> all right, okay. <clears throat> you got it, well done. Okay, it's money is by far, it doesn't, it's not just the Scottish problem, it's not just the UK problem. Internationally, money is the biggest problem, okay? The best thing we could do is shut down the health service and just give people the cash, okay? You know, there is an argument that one of the best things the health service does is just to employ people, okay? So we employ people, we make a bit more money, that improves our health, we spend a bit more money in the economy, it's Keynesian economics, okay? Now, I work in a remote and rural area. The NHS is by far the biggest employer in a lot of the areas I'm in just now, okay? So all a bit of business about shutting hospitals and weed individual places. 
okay, yeah, there might be a there might be an, there might be some sort of argument for doing that. But you've got to be aware that it's supporting the economy as well. Anyway, beside the point. So, um, so if you're in the least deprived postcode over here, okay, uh, this is from census data. Your healthy life expectancy is about 71, and then about 10 years not in good health. Okay, this is from birth. I'll, I'll come in later slides. The older you get, the better it gets. If you're in the most deprived pay code, your healthy life expectancy is 53, okay? Followed by another 17 years in bad health. It's like a different planet. Okay, which of these bars is the most overspent in Scotland? Yep, this one over here, okay? Okay, and I'll, I'll be honest, the most, and the one that's most prominent in is Greater Glasgow, who have the most deprived folk, all right? So um, it's true for all health boards. But the overspend, you know, the overspend per postcode is vastly higher in this group here, largely because the health service is set up to meet the needs of people in this postcode, because it's run by people in this postcode who think about people in that postcode and for who the normal world is what they see. Okay, so I am the, in this postcode. I wasn't born in that postcode, but that's the one I'm in the now, and I, I'm as rich as stink. Okay, realistically speaking, you know. <laughs> And anyone who's a doctor, you know, I'm paid in gold, okay? You know, I work a lot of weekends, I do a lot of hours, I've got a responsible job, but, you know, I, I'm paid in gold and I live over here. And we've got to be really careful when we're trying to do things because we set normal as to what we know ourselves and what we know for our parents, okay? So if you were born into postcode one and live in postcode one, your parents aren't going to be developing all these problems until they're up here somewhere. Likely when you're retired, your kids are growing, your kids have left school and things like that. That's a very different experience from folk here who, you know, you're getting ill at 53, okay? So it means that if your parent's 53, you're starting to deal with ill parents who can't work when you're in your 20s, okay? So it's a very different part of the world. Okay, multimorbidity is common in Scotland, all right? This is um, from Bruce Guthrie's group. <clears throat> so having one condition is very unusual now. It's much more likely to have two or more long conditions than one. And we've set up a health service entirely around people having one condition. Everybody's an ologist, all right? And that's extremely uncommon. And the older you get, the more likely you are to have multiple, multiple morbidities. And you, you understand the problem with that. So um, my favorite joke is um, the amount of people I get referred to my clinic who are breathless, okay? They've seen a cardiologist, not a cardiac cause of breathlessness. They've seen a respiratory physician. It's not a respiratory cause of breathlessness. Well, what the heck is it? You know, you know, what other organ system do you think is causing this? And the problem is it's likely to be a bit of both and some deconditioning and all sorts of other things on top of it as well. And people go bouncing between these specialties trying to find what the problem is. Next. Um, uh, again, deprivation magnifies this dramatically. So if you're in a poorer postcode, you get your multimorbidity about 10 years earlier. And as soon as you get multimorbidity, you cease to make sense to specialists, all right? And you stop fitting the box. So one of the reasons why there's a bigger um, spend in the richer postcodes is they get an awful lot more elective work done because it makes sense to them. It's single organ problems. They go through much more quickly. And the multimorbid group don't fit into any boxes. There's nobody there to look after them. Primary care is under the amount of pressure. It's unbelievable time-wise. And therefore, they're the ones that bounce in and out of A&E because there's just nobody else to sort them. So... so Deprivation and functional impairment in Highland. This gave me a gasp when I looked at this, okay? So I'm doing Highland. I'm trying to personalize this a wee bit. I'm just like everybody else. So this is um, people reporting that they have their day-to-day -day activity affected by a long-term health or disability. So I, who am in the red group here, the richest bit of Highland, um, will start to notice that between the age of 65 and 75, perhaps, you know, but by about 75, about a quarter people who earn as much as I do will be feeling that, all right? If I'm in the poorest postcode, I only have to be 50 to have that sort of statistic. So the, the men in Highland are becoming much older depending where you live. So on average, if you're rich, you live longer in good health, you have a shorter proportion of, have a, a longer proportion of life in poor health, sorry, that's wrong, more likely to have a single pathology and more likely to be the sort of person that sets up the healthcare system. Remember the inverse care law, overspend tends to match the richest postcodes. There's a map for Highland for palliative care. Do you want to do a postcode map and see where it's, get, where it's going? More ranting. <laughs> <laughs> I get a bit funny too, just to keep you on board. Okay. <laughs> Next, society is incredibly unrealistic about where they're actually going to die. So location of death in Highland from 1999 to 2012, and yes, indeed, there was a decent drop in the number of people dying in hospital, 
But it wasn't because more people were dying at home, it's because a lot more people were dying in care homes. All right? 16% drop of people dying in hospital, 30% increase in people dying in care homes. And that is the truth, that, is, that, is, that, will, that will be international. So if you want to see it in a lovely pretty chart, the purple one is um, care home deaths. They just become more prominent. Hospital becomes less, and that's the middle. The, the, the hospice is somewhere in the middle. That's fairly static, and that will be similar for most health boards. Place of death is a feminist issue, okay? So uh, this is a real shame. So feminism is not just about women's rights, okay? I'm actually quite a feminist. If you get into kind of ethics and all the rest of it, if there's a certain way of thinking, but never mind, we're going to use it because it's a nice top. <laughs> Women are a lot more likely to die in a care home than a man. Massively more likely. Uh, women care for men who die at home and there is no one left to care for them, realistically, is what happens. So I try and think about it. So there are families, all these women have kids, but the person that's going to care for you is the person who's stuck in the house with you, okay? So if my kids get ill, I will look after them, all right, because I love them. But even if I didn't, they're in the bloody house, okay? <laughs> you know, and I... <laughs> Up, up to a certain point, it's just easier for me to look after them, get somebody else to do it. And the usual thing about it grows on you as well. I will look after my wife, largely because it's going to be more less asshole than getting rid of her. Okay? <laughs> and, it, and that's it. Whereas if my parents get sick, I would have to completely restructure my life, move house, get a new job, all that sort of stuff, and look after them. And that's all sorts of barriers between doing something that I'm maybe not that keen on doing anyway. All right? So I'm not a huge romantic, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, <laughs> Highland 2012-2013, so 13% of male deaths were in a care home. 26%, one in four of women who died in Highland died in a care home. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but that's where they're dying, okay? And, the, and actually the biggest next group was them dying in hospital, okay, not dying at home. Uh, and that just, gives you, that just gives you the spread about where, where people go. Um, age groups, who's doing the dying, okay? It's old folk, okay? So deaths under the age of, sorry about the surprise, um, under 64s are here. Actually, the biggest group of people who die at home are men under the age of 64 in Highland. By far the biggest group. Um, <clears throat> carers on board, all that sort of stuff as well. And also, the, we're, we're really rubbish at just going, okay, I'm going to die this morning, okay? <laughs> you, know, um, you know, we're still quite bad for the whole sudden male death thing. Um, so do your wills and things like that. It comes out to that later on. So um, geriatrics has struggled to get a decent definition over the years. Nobody really understands what geriatrics is. So what about palliative care on an industrial scale? All right. <clears throat> okay. I'll get onto the case in a second. Parents to teach and recognize. I'm going to run through this because you taught us all this, and I'm not going to teach it back to you. This is Prof Murray's article, hello, um, from years ago from the BMJ. Um, wonderful stuff about teaching people about the trajectories in life, okay? This is my version of it. Um, <laughs> it's almost exactly the same, but I had to credit him because one I do all the time, and he's in the audience. So, various different ways of dying. You get your sudden death where, you know, a horrible thing happens, you go down, and actually we're quite good at fixing that. That's your meningitis and your pneumonias and all these things. We get you back. There's the dip, you get better, you get back, but not quite to where you were before, and then you go down. The care home curve, where you sit close to dying for a long period of time, still difficult to understand. Your standard palliative care curve, so you get cancer and you do all right, and then you fall apart. There's another reason to get this, and that's the extreme elderly. So extreme elderly, so people in their late 90s, early 100s, often die very quickly or apparently, you know, function quite well, limited, and then get overwhelmed and go downhill. But the society need to understand that. I'll skip over that because I'm teaching people to suck eggs. I need to try not to do that. Although it's been ages since I met a granny who could suck eggs. <laughs> I was going to speak, actually, um, Esther's in the audience who's a registrar. It might be a brilliant Christmas BMJ article to interview all the grannies you can meet and find if any of them can suck eggs and do a research project on that. Anyway, okay. You definitely get it published. It'd be fab. Okay, some cases. Okay, so this one's the old boy from up. I will not show you the, the starty video because one, we don't have a lot of time and also there's one thing about that start of the film up that I <laughs> didn't think was accurate. Okay, so this is his wife, okay, and they live together. Uh, I'm not going to tell you how old they are because telling you how old they are just tells you what social class they're in, all right? Um, they've got a family. The family live away from home. Now, I live in Highland, so people typically and often live far from their relatives, but that's not just a Highland thing, okay? Everyone, you know, people have to move for work now. My folks are in Glasgow. I live in Inverness. Um, you know, my, my wife's family is the same. We do get spread out. 
I'm going to do some really nasty things to her, so I'm going to reward her with a lovely detached house and a little red car that she goes flying about in the weekend in the Highland Roads with her husband, okay? So she is quite rich, okay, sorry, sorry, okay, it's not, <laughs> this, isn't the depri- this isn't the deprivation case, we do nice things there. So um, he spends his time in the garden, she spends her time at home, okay? Secret to happy marriage is not to spend too long with your husband or wife. <laughs> Good, it's not just me. Okay. Um, <laughs> postcard to my wife, okay. <clears throat> so I'm going to put her on a frailty curve, all right? So she gets an MI, uh, she gets a dip after that, she gets diabetes, she gets a dip, then she has a TIA, and then she gets COPD, and she's a bit breathless, and she's about there. So she's lost a fair amount of her physiological reserve. She's, so she's not driving anymore, her husband does that. She gets lifts to the shops. She cooks a bit, but her husband's doing a bit more of that. She tires more easily, and she's cognitively fine. We might go into that a little bit later on. So she's good, but she's not fantastic, okay? But it's quite possible that she and her husband and her family don't see it like that. They, they don't see this graph, partly because people don't have graphs on them, but pe- <clears throat> people often lose a lot of function without people noticing. And largely it's because what happens is that you reduce the box of your life. You know, you you just do less. So as long as you're functioning well within the box of your life as is just now, you know, know, people typically don't notice. And therefore it can be a shock when that person falls apart with a relatively minor illness. And, uh, you know, I've had that conversation frequently. You know, know, she was fine before she got into hospital and she's now totally dire. Now it might be because we did something daft to her, but it might be that just that, that that person's lost a little bit of more reserve than folk think she did. So what's our life expectancy? Be prepared for a shock, okay? So this is um, Scotland, healthy life expectancy in Scotland, okay, from birth. So all comers, healthy life expectancy from birth is 65 years in Scotland with 15 years in poor health. The the older you get healthy, it's a good thing to be old and healthy. It shouldn't be, but it's a negative, okay? So so say you're 75 and old and healthy, you you can expect seven years of poor health before you die compared to the 15 years you would have expected at birth. So, the, so these people are winners, and this, this green bit is the bit in poor health, so as a proportion of your whole life, the longer you can put off becoming an ill health, the better, because it will be a much shorter fraction of your life. It's a big health economic argument, that as well, about public health. So let's say she's between 75 and 80, uh, and we'll say that she's just starting not in good health. She could probably last for five to seven years. It's a long time. It's a long time. It sounds like a long time, but she wouldn't do all that well if she gets a major illness. Now, a lot of you will have had experience of this in your families, but we cannot wait for everyone in the population to have had experience of this with their own families, all right? Before we make political change. Because what will happen here is that she'll be fine, and then when she's not fine, it's a catastrophe, okay? And that's fine the first time it happens and the second time it happens, but over five, six, seven years, okay? You know, you, you know the exhaustion factor among families, you know, like it seems to be relentlessly you're about to go on your summer holiday when your mother gets ill, okay? And that's heroic the first time, and it's less heroic the second time, and then the third time, and the, you know, it, you know these, this is a big pressure of a long period of time, increasing numbers of our population are having to live with. So priorities here. Need to ensure that the simple things are prompted. Power of attorney, wills. Who makes decisions if you can't make decisions for yourself? I have got time. <laughs> okay. Um, I was wondering if I'd have time for this little one, but it doesn't matter. Okay. So power of attorney. How do you sell power of attorney? Um, so you all know it's a catastrophe. So if somebody loses capacity and somebody can't authorise financial or welfare decisions for themselves, it is an absolute nightmare, Okay. Um, But everybody should have power of attorney from my own age. I won't look for hands, but everyone in the room should have power of attorney, particularly if you've got kids, okay? So if I'm trying to get younger people to use this analogy, so have you all all, all heard of Harry Potter? (laughs) All heard of Harry Potter? Yeah, okay. Okay, so so everybody imagines that if they die, it'll be like the Harry Potter situation, okay? So me and my wife will get zapped by Voldemort, okay? And it's fabby because my, my sister will look after my four children, but she'll get to sell my house and get the money from that. My NHS will pay, will pay out. I've got life insurance. So she'll get my four kids, but she'll get lots of cash to look after them, okay? Who was the real hero in Harry Potter? It was Neville Longbottom with the grumpiest granny you've ever met in your entire life in the books, okay? No wonder she was grumpy, okay? So she gets this kid, okay? Her parents are in St. Mungo's Hospital because they're ill but not dead, but incapacitated. I have no idea what the fees are for St. Mungo's Hospital, but it didn't feel like a particularly NHS-tastic world, and she wouldn't be able to access their finances. 
So she's stuck with having to look after this kid and can't access the money. And that's the sort of, you know, examples that gets home to people. And that's why young people need to have power of attorney. Because if me and my wife go in a car crash or something and, are, and don't have the good, you know, manners to just be dead, um, I want her to be able to look after the kids and get the money. Okay, next. Future protecting. It'd be interesting how little of this is medical. Suitable house, suitable location. How would you manage without the car? These are important questions, and they're important questions to think about well ahead of time, okay? My parents will not be different. It takes a long time to come around to decisions and to delay things. You have to go things at time and time again. And people often don't want to live in houses they've got a lot of happy memories from, even if they are catastrophically unsuited for getting older in. But you know what it's like. Those happy me the happy memories of those houses will quickly get overridden by the horror of trying to exist in that house or being stuck in hospital for six months because you can't get up and down your stairs. Are you in a suitable location? It's a big Highland issue. Please do not retire to the end of a glen, okay? <laughs> <clears throat> it's really funny. So in Highland, what happens is all the townies like me go and retire to the end of the glen. At the same time, all the people that live at the end of the glen move into the town because that's what you do when you get older, okay? And how would you manage without the car? Okay, and nextly, consider time to benefit when considering treatments, okay? So a lot of treatments that we give out there, a lot of drugs, 10, 15, 20 years to get benefit from. And you've got to start investing in that as well. It's important for all sorts of things. So you guys are on to a lot of you know, hard decisions about cancer treatments and things like that as well. So if you're going to go through your cancer treatment, you're going to feel hellish, I would imagine, for to feel better over a longer period of time. But it's quite important to have some vague idea of what that longer period of time is going to be. The adult's views. This is definitely the time to get an idea of what she thinks because it might not be that much longer that she's going to be heard or audible. And again, you know the situation as people get frailer. Just because they can't speak so well and the cognition goes down, their voice gets lower and lower and lower. And this is a very good time to get an idea of what they think. And what about this? As a society chat, at what point does it become an unwise move to avoid a peaceful death? Okay, someone call for medical this weekend. I'll be covering high dependency. Please get the violins out. It's horrible. And it'll be busy. But I get paid in gold, so it's fine. Um, <clears throat> and I think of all those people I pull through intensive care and high dependency admissions, and then I see them in care homes a few years later having lost absolutely everything and dying of advancing neurodegenerative conditions, which are truly horrific, okay? We need to be careful about this. So I'm not the CMO, but the CMO's Realistic Medicine Report, one of the big things she comes up with again and again, the amount of doctors that advise people to take treatments that they would not have themselves. Okay, so treatment outcomes we need to be thinking about. It's not just... So we typically are very good at telling people the prospect of a good result from this treatment is X. The prospect of being dead is Y. Okay, and folk are quite happy with that digital outcome. I'll be fantastic or I'll be dead. Easy, take that, okay? It's not, it's the prospect of being in a reduced state is what really worries people. You know, how many of these, how many people that go through this will end up in a care home within two years, for instance? And this business to deal with as quick as we can. Unrealistic statements, number one, is I never want to go into a care home. Even worse, I promised him or her I would never put them in a home. That is almost never done with any realistic expectation of what that would mean in practice. If you could get a video of the last two years of your life and sh is that what you were, what, think you were promising to do or your husband was promising to do? I think not. Okay, so we're going to take it a wee bit further on <clears throat> and she's going to fall and get a lumbar vertebral fracture and she's going to get a bit delirious and actually it turns out she's got dementia so her cognition wasn't that fantastic. And now all it takes is a urinary tract infection to knock her off. So what's the house like now? Well, husband isn't seeing much of the garden anymore. On and off the toilet all the time. It's becoming a big issue through the day. Night times are not so good. She sleeps for two or three hours at the start of night, and then she's up about every hour or so. She gets back to sleep. He doesn't. Um, getting food into her is becoming more of a challenge. Not when the family are around. When the family are around, she eats fine and wonder what the problem is. In fact, all the family see is an increasingly grumpy looking old man. And, you know, wonder, you know, just encourage her, she'll be fine. <laughs> Thanks for that. Okay, you know. Um, and that lovely house now seems like a very small place indeed. And she'll be on 10,000 ridiculous pills, okay? <laughs> Not the chat for today, but almost guaranteed she'll be on ridiculous numbers of pills. Okay, please see the other talk for that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> 
So thoughts, what are the patient's priorities likely to be? What are the carer's priorities likely to be? What are the health service priorities likely to be? I run this as a workshop from time to time. Things you get, so the patient, so if you do the method acting of what it's like to have dementia, the world is a very short term place. You know, if the husband's out of the room, you can get distressed. You know, familiar environments are important. My goodness, the toilet, that type of thing. Carer's priorities. Sometimes people say he feels exhausted and wants a break. He probably won't notice he's exhausted, okay? So most of us think of exhaustion, so I'll be, <laughs> I'm going on about the on-call. Uh, I'll be exhausted on Monday, okay? That's not exhaustion, that's just being tired, okay? Because I've been up late the night before, I'll recover, it'll be fine. Exhaustion is when you're not getting enough sleep and working too hard every single night for a long period of time, and that creeps up on you. Um, stories, uh, oh, so I had a chap that, so his wife, um, took forever to settle a night with her dementia, so he sat reading his book sitting on the floor so that if he fell asleep, he would fall over and wake up again because she was likely to fall before she went to bed and things like that as well. And would, you know, if you put the cooker on when he was watching it, he would go through and watch the telly, but he would stand up watching the telly for fear of, you know, sitting down and, you know, all the rest of it as well. You know, it's incredible what a lot of people out there are going through. What the hit? So his priority is likely about, you know, good care for his wife and looking after us as a generation that really meant it with death do us part. What are the health service priorities likely to be? Number one answer 10,000 times is do not admit her to hospital. If she's in hospital, get her out as soon as it's humanly possible. Okay? You know, that could not be louder as a message. But it's, you know, neither of their priorities are there. They're not sitting with their bags packed going, the thing I want to do most of all is be admitted to hospital today. And that's a really incredibly negative message that we're putting out there. And actually, unfortunately, because we're looking at everything from the point of view of the only thing we must do is not admit people to hospital. That, that you're not going to get, you're not going to get what you want there. I was going to say what the second priority was, you'll be seeing her through the, the window of her multiple morbidities. It will be her diabetes, it will be her previous MI, it will be her osteoporosis. You, you, you'll chunk her all up. So what happens next? Just ponder that for a second. So you all know this scenario, is that right? There's a lot of it out there. So the problem with up was the wrong person died, Okay. Most likely thing that happens here is he dies. Okay? In fact, actually, that's not the worst thing that can happen. I'll tell you the worst thing that can happen in a minute. Care or stress and morbidity and mortality is absolutely enormous. Okay? So um, I went round, I was in Invergordon, so a 28 buried unit. Three, pa three patients there, their main carer had died during that admission. One of them while they're waiting for them to come home for a home visit. You know, it's incredibly common. And um, we just don't look after carers well enough and they get burnt out and they, and they die. And that's not good for anybody. It makes the situation tidy. She clearly has to go into a care home now, but, but you know, that's a big issue. But you know what? It's not the worst thing that can happen. How many people become nicer human beings when they're tired? <laughs> anybody here become a nicer human being when they're tired? Okay. No, 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 we don't. Um, if I was the chief medical officer, my report would, call be, would be called being human, okay? And there's a lot of things you can get from that. But we expect people to be superhuman. That was the other problem with up as well. It was lovely, but it slightly idealized what it's like to be a carer, okay? You get exhausted, you get tired, you get grumpy, okay? You know, eventually they get a home carer and she doesn't do the right thing, you shout at her. You should not shout at her. I'm not saying that's a good thing to do. But you see these situations going and he gets grumpy with his family and doesn't get on. And actually, maybe he wasn't a saint to start off with. He was a normal person. Maybe he had a normal marriage to start off with where sometimes they got on and sometimes they didn't. And these things can go very bad. And actually, you end up with a situation where these, you know, it's a vulnerable adult situation because he's shouting at and all the rest of it as well. It's a complete tragedy. So sometimes being deaf is not the worst thing that can happen. So what makes the difference here? Home care, paid or unpaid, perhaps flexibly. Some days she's fine and some days she's not. Respite of whatever type. I'm not just talking about care homes. All the services out there that will sit with your relative and chat to them so you can get out and do something else are completely invaluable, okay? Uh, the business about a care home move before this collapses, all right? So there's an issue about care homes, and we want to delay people going into care homes. There's a huge amount of stuff published about um, the length of stay people have in care homes before they die, and we want to reduce that. And I was like, that's a really unwise target, by the way, because you reduce it by more of them dying. Um, and <clears throat> so, but, you know, before a collapse, rather than what's happening at the moment, which is that people are going into care homes, particularly if they can't fund it themselves, when everything has fallen apart and everyone's broken, and all you do is increase the number of casualties. Lastly, lots and lots of wise, supportive words. Wise, supportive words, not it'll be all right, you're fine, you're doing a great job. Those are supportive words, but they're not very wise. 
The wise ones are, you are exhausted, okay? One person clearly cannot do that forever, okay? You're going to need help or it's going to collapse. Those are wiser words. And lastly, next scenario is about a family. Yep, good time. Um, a family on the same page helps an awful lot as well. And we can do a lot to educate that. Things that make almost no difference, most of her pills, CT scans and blood tests, admissions to exclude things, and anyone who focuses on just one bit. Most valuable assets, as we said. So all agreed, talk is good, focus on the whole picture, individualised treatment, treat the unit as well as the individual. Fair enough. But you haven't met Beyonce's granny yet, okay? So anyway, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do the Beyonce song. I'll do the Beyonce song. I'll tell you, okay? So I was having a, I was having a wee go at this with um, the team up in Thurso. So it was a district nurse and a student nurse and I said, what Beyonce song do you think uh, I would do? Uh, and you went, all the single ladies? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's not all the single ladies. <laughs> Clearly, we link with Beyonce on a different level. Anyway, um, okay. <clears throat> so, uh, we'll make this a, ma uh, a man this time. If I get my sexes mixed up, just because I'm in hurrying. Uh, he's old, we'll say, just, we'll say he's in his 80s, so he's unequivocally old, and he gets unwell, and he gets admitted to hospital, and he's really not well, and lots of fancy things happen. A few days later, family are all around the bed, and he's still not very well, and the doctor's having a decent chat about, look, you think he's not going to do, and they have the conversation. And they draw a line about what they're going to do, and we don't do very much. And he gets better. And he goes home. And he could live in a number of situations. He could be in a care home, he could be supported by the family at home. Fine. A year passes, and then he's no very well again. And then he goes into hospital. And the family are called, and all sorts of exciting things happen. And after a few days, he's not looking very well. And the family get called in, and they have the same chat again. And again, a year later. All right? This is a nightmare, okay? <clears throat> it's, not bad that he's, it's not bad that he's surviving, okay? It's just a nightmare about how do we communicate and how do we help people through this? So the Beyonce song is, I'm a survivor. I'm a survivor, not gonna give up. <laughs> it's a brilliant song. It really is superb. Anyway, okay. Anyway, never mind, okay, it's just... It's a song that saves lives, I think, but never mind. Okay, so anyway, so anyway. So he... He or she could die on any of these deteriorations, but doesn't. And you get this issue of learned immortality. That, you know, fails you to get close to death, you look like you're going to die, but you don't. Doc said they would die three times so far. So it's a nightmare, unpredictable situation. So let's call the family unrealistic. That's often what happens. The family are unrealistic. Okay. Or distant relative syndrome or something like that. Often what's happening is that they're just seeing a different reality. Okay. So they're seeing this person, they've been, they've been as ill as this times before, and they come and talk about DNA CPR again, and they come and talk about this again, but she'll get better. And actually sometimes they can go from the first time they talk about limiting things, they're great, and then the third time you talk about it, they go, well, wait, we got better all these times before, you can't stop. Well, we have to. Um, she bounced back the last three times. And also, sometimes the health service is a bit rubbish, okay? And, you know, and it, you know, the more you get interacted with it, the more likely that is to happen. It might be on one of the admissions that she wasn't well because of something stupid that we did. One of the many stupid pills, for instance. We nearly need to be able to understand and explain frailty better to people. Yes, she might die, but she might not. People can come back. It might not be this one that she dies of, but it will be something very like this. This is what it's going to look like. We can't tell which of these dips she's going to die on, that type of thing, and all the uncertainty that goes with that. How does arguments over spilt milk help? Okay, so, um, <clears throat> so frequently what will happen is that you'll be dealt with, you'll be faced with a very angry family, okay? So... I try and teach juniors about how to start to interact with that, okay? So um, I'll, use an argue, I'll, use an, I'll use another marriage one, okay? But this works, so I'll use me and my wife, okay? But it will also work if my wife was a man. It would also work if, you know, in any one of a number of different situations. She's not a man, but she would be really <laughs> upset if I said that. But there's a, oh, I just don't have time for this. I do have time for the story, okay? So uh, my, I've got a typically a Swedish mother, and I didn't date from about the age of 17 until I was like 28, because I was, you know, I was working on all the rest of it as well. So anyway, I eventually met my new, new wife, and I phoned up my mum, and I went, um, hi, I've got somebody I'd like you to meet, and I could hear her holding her breath. And she's called Elizabeth. <laughs> and I could audibly hear her go, <sighs> I know, what was... What, what was really nice about that was that I just knew that she was preparing herself to be really positive if I said Nigel. 
because she was waiting for me to say Nigel because I was 28 I was from Glasgow and I wasn't married I was therefore gay you know and, uh, I, and she wouldn't have had a problem with that but it was just it was just such a nice moment anyway beside the point okay back to my own wife okay arguments over spilt milk so so um, let's say I've been working really hard and I've been down at this conference, I've been on call the weekend, I've been on every late one night and I come in from work on Monday night, really late, 8 o'clock and my wife goes utterly space cadet at me, right? Because I came in late the night before and I made some frosties and I left my milk out the fridge, okay? And therefore the milk went off and there was no milk for the kids the next day, okay? And she goes completely space cadet, right? So I apologise, humbly, okay, I'm really, really sorry. I explain what happened. I develop a system to guarantee that it'll never happen again. I put an electronic tag on the milk, okay, and I, I, I attach it to an app on my phone, okay. So if I go to bed at any night without it, it'll buzz and I'll have to go down and I'll have to put it back in the fridge again, okay. And I humbly apologise again. And she'll still be cross with me. Why is that? Okay. And it's because it's nothing to do with the milk. It's to do with I've not been around, I've not been, looking, not been paying attention, I've just been a crap husband, basically, okay. And that's what happens with relatives as well. So they'll come in and they'll be furious. In this sort of situation, they'll be furious because you've lost her crutch or lost her teeth or something like that as well. And you can, do, you can get her crutch sorted, you can get her teeth sorted, do all the rest of it as well. And they'll still be crossing, you'll not know why. And it's probably because you've not been including them all the way along. And focusing on exactly what they're complaining about isn't the problem. Next. So most valuable assets in primary care, we're nearly at the end. So unpaid carers, family, paid carers, nursing home beds. And the fourth one is a human, human actually, it should, it should say, a human being who can explain what's going on. It's probably the most valuable thing we could have if, you know, fourth on the list. Spice Girls song? Yay! It is! It's one of you. Tell me what you want, but you really, really want. Excellent. Some good slides here. Um, so what do we want? they want? So we want good care in our old age, but we really want still massive hospitals, expensive doctors like me, expensive drugs, expensive treatments and short waiting lists, and we're still erring on the side of voting for that. Compare your hospice and your care home, okay? Hospice looks after people near the end of life. Holistic care is paramount, free at point of access. Lovability index for hospices, as we said, is enormous, okay? Chances of a fun run being done for your hospice, try and stop people. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> Very well respected establishments, okay? Care homes, they look after people near the end of life. Holistic care is paramount and a lot of excellent good care home managers. Means tested though, okay? You have to pay to get in there, okay? And uh, you really do not want to be reliant on the, what council pays. So to make your care home run now, you need to have at least 35% self-funders or you will go bankrupt, okay? Because what we pay if you're not self-funding is, is nowhere near what it actually costs to look after people. Ouch. And lovability index, well, not so much, maybe. Chance of a fun run been done? No, you'll do a fun run past your local care home. You will not. <laughs> and under a bit of a cloud, okay? So if you open a new hospice somewhere in Highland, okay, you will have good staff of mine queuing up for jobs in there, okay? And you'll nick all the good staff off me. No, please feel free to, but that'll be what happens, all right? If I open a new care home, I'll be really struggling to get staff in that care home. And that absolutely needs to change how people see them. So palliative care has a high lovability index, has political influence, has lots of cash and can mobilise a lot of people. So what would I like? <laughs> I'm going to run away and have lunch now. Think about this. Support even subsidised with time, money and political influence. Good care homes, good care injuries and good respite. Training in both maybe respite. Try and use the brand that you've got to increase the attractiveness of those workplaces. You know, so um, hospice beds in care homes. If you're going to build a new hospice, build a care home with it as well. Because we're already um, using self-funders and care home to subsidise non-self-funders, okay? Think of the money you're raising. Think about what your hospice beds cost per week to run and then talk to your local care home manager, okay? It's incredible. These are things, you know, if you really want to get into improving the palliative care of the ageing population, you really need to get into the nuts and bolts things that help. And those are those. Nearly there. The human being who can understand and explain what can palliative care do to encourage folk into the, the key specialties here. Now, it's not an endless list, so general practice is the number one. I've got lots of good people who want to go in and do palliative care. It's a very popular thing for good doctors to want to do, but they can't all do that. You need to find some way of trying to get them to do general practice instead and to find some way of getting more people to go into general practice and stay in there. And that might just be about subsidising as well. 
Okay? They're all businesses, your GP with special interest in palliative care, whose practice gets paid for them to do more palliative care so they can just have more bodies on the ground. The same with nursing, the same with practice nursing, the same with anything you care to mention. Okay? The problem is it's not quite so easy to hang your hat on as a building. And that's me. So I've introduced you to Beyonce's granny. I'm a survivor. I've introduced you to the chat from up. I've introduced you from ABBA. Money, money, money. And what you want, and a wee bit of argument over spilt milk. So I'm happy to take questions now, or you can just go for lunch and harass me over lunch. <laughs> And, it, and it's three minutes past one, so have we clap for that as well? Okay, no. Okay. Yeah. I'll take one question if we've got one, and then we'll go for lunch and you can catch Martin there. This one here. David Gray. Great talk, man. Always a privilege to hear you speak. Um, I just want your views on HSMR targets, um, in that if we have targets to keep people alive longer in hospital, or if we're seen to be outliers, we may be providing better care because people are dying in a short space of time. We're not intervening. And it would seem to be that we've got potentially... Yeah, no, I don't agree with that. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> so we do need some sort of mortality review. I mean, I, want, I, I even think that absolute mortality rates would be more useful than the standardised ones. The big problem with the standardised ones is just the way you're calculated. So um, a bit of detail probably helps with the answer to that. So if you die, you count as one, OK? So you get minus one for the hospital. Um, so if you come in guaranteed to die, you're a, you're a minus one. But you cannot, get, you cannot have a predicted death on admission of one. Okay, so it's always 0.7. So if, if you, even if you're an expected death, you're a, you, you, you're, you're, an, um, you're a negative. So it can be very, very disproportionate as to whether there's anywhere else that a person can realistically die. So I do think we need to have HSMR, uh, some sort of mortality rate just to see if things are changing. But I do think... That, that I agree with you that it can be quite a big problem. That not dying is not the target. It's okay. That was a really complicated question for lunch. Okay, <laughs> thank you very oh, much. Oh, can I take one more? There was a hand okay, there. One more. I'll take one more. I don't mean to sound facetious, but. <laughs> When I'm a frail old lady, how do I make sure I get a doctor like you fighting my corner? <laughs> that, that was a really nice thing to say, but um, I'll, I'll not answer that. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. <laughs>